Okay, good morning. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today, Paper Cup Recycling in the UK, the Past, Present and Future. Okay, so my name is Samantha Ward. I am National Cup Recycling Manager at Felpac. I'm also joined by Peter Goodwin, founder and managing partner at CoCreate and founder of Simply Cups. So I'm going to start by outlining the background to how the National Cup Recycling Scheme came about and then move on to talk through three key elements of cup recycling. So the issues, the solution and the actual cup recycling process itself. I'll then hand over to Peter from Simply Cups, who is going to talk about collections, sort of his learning so far, main challenges, and also what the future of cup recycling might look like. I'll then share the scheme success so far before discussing the future of the scheme, and then finally how you can get involved. Okay, so the National Cup Recycling Scheme was developed and launched in April 2018 by Valpac and Costa. There were initially five waste collectors signed up, and at this time, the UK cup recycling rate was only about one in 400 cups that were being recycled. In September 2018, Café Nero, Greggs and Pratamonje joined the scheme, and then in November 2018, McDonald's joined the scheme. By September 2019, the scheme had collected and recycled over 100 million cups. In April 2020, so April this year, the scheme entered into its third year and Levats the Professional became the most recent member to join the scheme. Now, in July 2020, the scheme has collected and recycled over 150 million cups and the scheme's recycling rate is now 1 in 17 cups and we have 27 waste collectors that are signed up. Okay, so the first issue with paper cups is that they are typically made of two materials. So they are roughly 95% virgin fiber paper with about 5% um, plastic polyethylene lining, which, which makes the coating of the cup. So this means that they can't be placed in mixed recycling, whether that's a mixed recycling bin at home or on the go. This generally leads to sort of the um, common misconception that cups cannot be recycled. However, this is, um, this is not the case. Cups can be recycled. They simply need to be collected in a separate waste stream in order for this to happen. So the challenge, therefore, um, lies in collecting the cups since they are generally consumed on the go, for example, when commuting or shopping. So what about other types of cups? So for context, I thought it'd be useful to look at other types of cups and how paper cups compare to those. So Hootamaki in their 2018 life cycle analysis study on paper cups found that in order to have a equal or smaller carbon footprint than paper cups, a ceramic mug would actually need to be used 350 times. A stainless steel reusable cup would need to be used at least 130 times and a plastic reusable cup would need to be used at least 20 times. So sort of in the long term, the preference may be towards reusable cups. Um, most of the brands that are part of the scheme offer their own incentives for reusable cups, such as discounts or points for using those. Um, however, the purpose of the National Cup Recycling Scheme is to provide a solution for paper cups while they exist. So moving on to the solution. The National Cup Recycling Scheme aims to make cup recycling commercially attractive to waste collectors. It works as follows. So a waste collector will collect and deliver cups to one of the three paper mills which are partnered with the scheme. So those are Dia Smith, James Cropper and Ace UK. The paper mill then tells us, so they tell Valpac, um, the amount of cups that the collectors have delivered that month. This, um, this makes the scheme unique in its ability to track and record the volume of cups that are being recycled. Valpac then pays the collector based on the amount of cups that the collector has delivered in, um, and this financial incentive is currently set at £70 per tonne of cups. So this payment comes from a, a, pot, so a, sort of a pool of money that the brands uh, have put together based on their market share of the cups. 
So the cup recycling process, the cup recycling process itself is relatively straightforward and not similar to standard paper recycling. So to start with, cups are collected, baled and sorted by the waste collector before being delivered to the paper mill. The cups are then pulped with water and the plastic lining is removed from the process. The fiber can then be used to make new paper products, for example, shopping bags and um, other kinds of paper packaging. Okay, handing over to Peter now for, for his feedback. Over to you, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thanks to um, to Samantha for, for inviting me on in the call. And I just really wanted to share probably the major learning from from our experiencing uh, for cut recycling via the Simply Cups scheme. So for those of you on the call who don't know Simply Cups, um, Simply Cups was a, a membership scheme that was founded in 2014 to really start cut collections in earnest in the UK. Uh, at the height before lockdown, we were probably collecting around about 15 to 20 million uh, paper and plastic cups each year uh, and subsequently have launched operations in, in Europe, in the Benelux, uh, and also successfully in Australia and New Zealand. Um, what I've got here on the first slide is really um, the, the material handling process from, from collection. Uh, and the key thing for us and the key learning probably over the last five, six years is that, you know, this process has to be efficient as possible for, it, for, for the whole solution to stack up uh, and be commercially viable, not only for collectors, but also to keep um, costs at the, uh, a palatable level for uh, end users as well. So the, the first thing to note about the process of collecting cups is um, typically they're collected on a different type of vehicle. You'll see a liveried Simply Cups fan there because predominantly uh, cups, given that the, the volumes aren't sufficient to uh, at this stage to use the likes of uh, a dust cart to collect the single stream, um, cups are predominantly collected in bags. So it's a, it's a bag collection that comes back to the depot where um, there are no currently kind of bells and whistles. There's no, you know, automated approach to this. It's still pretty manual. Um, from the day we started, we started with one skip in the yard putting cups into it, and it's kind of just um, the manual element of that has, has grown. So literally the, the bags, uh, which are dedicated bags labelled simply cups, come back to the yard. Uh, they are then either deposited on the floor um, or then put into uh, directly, if they are free from contamination, uh, into 1100 wheelie bins. And, and this is the key thing, really. There is not much, um, there is not much budget available to remove contamination. So the key, the key thing from a collector's point is, is for cups to be free from contamination. Uh, these materials are then, uh, then tipped from the bins into a baler. Uh, and then baled into probably 400 to 450 kilogram mill sized bales, uh, and then stacked onto the side of an Arctic um, in a full load to be sent to uh, one of the recycling partners. Um, so I, I think from, from, from this you'll see is it, it's not as automated. I mean, potentially, given the given the, the opportunity to collect more cups, this, this process definitely could be automated, but I think it's worth recognizing at this moment in time um, that, it, that it's very manual. And if we new, move on to the, uh, the next uh, slide, uh, I think that the biggest fear for us when we first started this process was the amount of contamination that would have to be re removed. Um, because certainly paying people to take out uh, materials or foreign materials from cups lying on the depot floor is a, is a costly exercise and, and just wouldn't stack up. So really the biggest learning from the, from the scheme is designing a system or, or a point of collection that ultimately eliminates uh, contamination. And that's kind of after a few years of trying, um, what you'll see on the screen now is really the, the result of that. Um, sorry, if we just go back to the, to the previous ones, that, no, no problem at all, is, is the result of that. And, and, and ultimately we came up with a, a tube system where, uh, where uh, consumers could see the contents of the tubes um, it uh, has different lids to prevent cups being put in the lid section, you know, cups being put in the liquid section, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore makes the process pretty straightforward for consumers. 
Um, now, I think the key thing about this is they, they also work very well without any additional communication. We put these bins straight onto major railway stations. Um, you'll see from the, the one with Chiltern Railways on the left, um, at the likes of a, a road chef by a Costa on the right. And without any surrounding communication, people do comply with this. And so for us, this was the, the, the key breakthrough because this is the one thing that makes the, 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 the solution viable because what we're getting, which we'll see from, from the next slide, is material, whether that be the, the paper cup or whether that be the lid, free from contamination. That means as a collector, all we are then doing is bulking the material, baling and shipping on. There's no, there, there's no uh, element of sortation within that. Uh, the, the challenge that then comes is that obviously then that means that we need that infrastructure. You know, separate cut bin infrastructure doesn't solve the wider problems of collecting materials on the go, um, but for cups it certainly works. So I, I think that the, the simple equation is the more collection bins we get out there, the more cups we're going to collect. Um, and, and so I think fundamentally anything out of anything we've learned and anything we took away from the last five six years is this is key to make it commercially viable and again i say that for both both the collector and the end user because if you're using a bag collection solution ultimately you're paying by volume um and a bag of, of cups loosely placed in there will probably take up we'll probably get about 75 to 100 cups in Whereas a bag of stack cups, as you'll see there on the left, will probably take 500. So there's a five to one saving in stacking the cups as well. So it kind of works for, for everyone. Um, just a bit of feedback from us in terms of the scheme. Um, I mean, ultimately, the scheme does help uh, and it is a step in the right direction to uh, encourage collectors um, to participate. As you will see, there are some challenges around you know, making it commercially viable, having the right infrastructure in terms of the collection fleet, uh, and also um, whether you can collect with other material streams, does it stack on its own? But I think it's definitely going in, in the right direction, uh, and it's very much a welcome move from the collectors. If I said that in 2014, when we started, we were paying facilities about £50 a tonne to take the cups, then obviously that's a, a big swing already, so definitely moving in the right direction. In terms of the um, cup recycling of the future, I mean, Simply Cups are here to stay and we will respond to uh, to, to market uh, forces and demands, you know, depending on the continual use of disposables. So, so we're committed to do this. But obviously, I, I think what we will see in the new normal is what, what the role of disposables will be, both in the short term and the long term, uh, and how we balance reuse uh, with single use which may in the short term be more a case of balancing science versus is fear. Um, and so I think it's pretty unclear where we will go. Um, but I'd I, I, I like to conclude by saying that, you know, what I think and hopefully and what, what I hope moving forward, that if, it, if, we, if we decide or, or businesses decide that they would like to follow the path of, of single use, then, then it's done responsibly and they engage with the right people, engage with the right schemes to ensure that if they're using single use, they're using single use products responsibly. Because, you know, like I say, they are a valuable product. The more we get back and the more we can create demand from them, then the better the commercials will become uh, for everyone involved. So thank you for my time, Samantha, and hopefully that short, short section um, <laughs> added some value. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, really useful and interesting. And I know, especially looking at bins uh, and contamination, has uh, has actually been uh, a big part of the uh, first six months of my role. Uh, there are many, many times of <laughs> many types of bin out there, um, tube styles, all different kinds, um, all, all trying to do the right thing by keeping that contamination out. Okay, so moving on then. Okay, so the National Cup Recycling Scheme has achieved a significant amount of success since it launched in 2018. So to date, the scheme has collected and recycled 155,355,545 cups. Um, so if we were to position those end to end, um, so they would reach from our Valpac office in Stratford-upon-Avon to Cairns on the east coast of Australia, so quite a lot. Um, this is actually the equivalent of 1,708 tons of cups that have been collected since the scheme launched. Um, a paper cup itself can actually be recycled up to seven times. 
there are now 27 waste collectors signed up to the scheme. Um, there are um, a few more also in the process of joining. We now have eight scheme members. So these are the major retailers that co-fund the scheme. So as I mentioned, Costa, McDonald's, Cafe Nero, Pret, Burger King, Greg's, Pure, and Lavazza Professional. And then we are partnered with the three paper mills, so James Cropper in the Lake District, DS Smith down in Kent, and then HUK in Halifax. Yes, yeah, so moving on to the future of cup recycling. So there are four main areas that the scheme wishes to focus on as we move forward. So obviously the first one is continuing to increase the number of cups that are collected and recycled in closed environments. Um, the second is to promote the scheme, raise awareness of cup recycling. So we now have a microsite, so a small website dedicated to the cup recycling scheme. We are on various social media platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So you can give those a follow as well to keep up with all things cup recycling. Um, then thirdly, um, we're also looking to encourage more brands and retailers to become scheme members and fourthly looking for more waste collectors to get involved, start collecting cups so that we can grow the coverage, grow the network of collectors and locations um, that, we, that we can cover with cup recycling as well. So how to get involved? So if you're a consumer, you can take your cup to a cup recycling point. So most of the scheme members have um, a, a kind of cup recycling bin, whether that's a tube or, or, or different style. Um, you're probably able to do that in store, or it may be that you hand your cup back to the barista. Um, it can vary. Um, at the minute, some stores may even have cup recycling bins outside of the store while social distancing is in place. Um, Okay, so then if you are a waste collector, it's free to sign up to the scheme. You can then start collecting cups and start receiving the financial incentive. Again, um, a good way of keeping um, any service offering competitive. If you're a business, you can find out whether your existing waste collector will also collect cups. So if they are signed up to the scheme, then you can talk to them about collecting cups, maybe from offices or other premises as well. Um, or if not, um, you can look online for the list of the 27 collectors and try asking one of those instead. Okay. So in summary then, we have so far seen that cups can be recycled and been through that process. Um, and, and really the main challenge then lies in collection. Um, both both in terms of collecting cups on the go and as Peter, as Peter really focused on ensuring that cups are free of contamination uh, and separated out into just cups being collected in, in that tube or, or bag or whatever the system may be. So really while paper cups exist, um, the scheme is ensuring that we have an efficient system for recycling cups for, for gathering those. The scheme has achieved a great amount of success in its first two years and this is something that we are aiming to continue um, into the future. Okay, so the future of cup recycling um, depends on a variety of things but mainly um, I think it comes down to increased awareness of cup recycling. The scheme has the capacity for more members to sign up, for more waste collectors to sign up uh, also. So really there are a range of ways that you can get involved with the National Cup Recycling Scheme and it's important to view cup recycling as a collective effort um, from all parts of the chain, um, collectors, businesses, um, consumers uh, themselves. Okay, so be part of the UK's leading cup recycling scheme. Okay, so we now have um, a few minutes, I think we have about 10 minutes actually for questions. So I will just have a quick look to see if we've had any questions in. Oh, there are a few. 
So another question, um, with new materials coming on stream to remove PE, how will this affect the collections when you could have okay. three, yeah, three plus materials, Peter? Yeah, look, I, I think look, if we just take the um, the collection side of things, um, I mean, fundamentally, what we are now seeing is different ways of trying to solve the problem. Now, one one of the ways that we we've seen uh, a lot of work focused on is uh, work around the barrier in the in the product's design um, to ensure that it can, you know, perhaps take a, a smoother passage, um, take less time to pulp, and therefore maybe be more attractive to. Uh, to the mills. From a from a collector's perspective, it's pretty simple for us. We're kind of driven by um, by the mills. Uh, fundamentally, if they are if they look at the barriers and they see that the barriers are um, are compatible with their process, then we'll we'll collect those cups. Evidently, sometimes it's difficult for us to control the cups we collect because they're not all from controlled environments. If you're collecting from a uh, from a station, for example, um, you're not going to be able to, to, to determine which cuts will go in there. I think the key thing, the key thing that we always reiterate in this, this argument is, you know, as far as we we know, and, and you know, I'll be corrected by anyone on this call, there is no mechanical way of separating cuts when collected in a commingled stream. Uh, fundamentally, um, cuts end up in a paper stream by chance, not by desire. Uh, and unless you turn them from a 3D into a 2D shape, um, technology cannot identify them. So at the moment, fundamentally, the only way to collect cups is to collect them as a, a single stream. Um, if you're then taking that single stream and sending them to uh, the mills, ultimately, if the mills accept all cups, then and they accept a PE line cup uh, and, a, and a compostable cup, really then, you know, the recyclability of the cup isn't in question. It might come down to the price of cup in the, in, in the first instance. So um, the reality is, if you're, if you're collecting cups as a single stream and sending them to mills, the PE lined cups that we started off with five years ago are as compliant as any other lining that comes onto the market. I think the key thing will be is how we can extract cups from a, from a co-mingled stream, potentially. And then just coming on to the question about the uh, the lids, yeah, I mean the lids are valuable. The lids probably have more value than than the cups themselves. We we prior to lockdown have developed a process when we collect plastic cups as well, and we'd worked out technology density separation technology where we could separate um, uh, polypropylene uh, from um, the. Uh, the other, the other ones escaped me, polystyrene, rigid polystyrene cups, mm. which typically we were collecting from the vending and the water cooler industry. So we have a way of, of separating those materials and then taking them onto compounds. They'd also be um, compliant for um, food grade as well because they come from a defined source. So, you know, there are markets for mm. that material, uh, active markets for that material. Again, it's, it's volumes. You imagine how many lids you need and, and obviously the amount of lids we, we capture um, you know, it takes a while to get to a load, probably 20 tonnes, which is what a reprocessor would look at. So, yeah, very valuable, the lids, just need a lot of them. <laughs> cool. Um, there's another question on here, Peter, as well. Um, it says, for smaller sites, how are they handling the storage of cups? How many times a week are the cups collected? Um, I know sort of from speaking to different collectors and the site they're going to, it can, it can vary um, how they do that. Uh, what, would you, what would you suggest? Yeah, look, look, being honestly, there isn't a very good solution at this moment in time for, for smaller sites. I mean, fundamentally, as a lot of things with a circular economy, it comes down to logistics and the cost of logistics. And, and in reality, the majority of, of Simply mm. Cups customers are large corporate businesses with hundreds or thousands of people uh, in a single office. So the question is, is that, you know, how do we how do we find a solution that, that accommodates this? And this might be looking at looking at typically a, a, a logistic solutions that aren't entrenched in the wind, in the waste industry. Perhaps other more career type services. We we've, we've we've experimented with post back and uh, and mm -hmm. tried to do this, um, but it's just not cost effective. So and and this is the same thing for retail as well. Small retailers, small coffee shops, even if they're taking the cups back. You know, if you've got a small shop, where do you store them? You know, the larger chains have the ability to backhaul on on quite evolved logistics networks, whereas small chains don't. So it is it is a problem. But I think as the kind of circular economy progresses, logistics is one of the key things, the movement of of materials. We're looking at mm. we're looking at a few things, but 
yeah, it, it, if I'm honest, it really only works for the larger sites at this moment okay. in time. Not to say that we need to forget the smaller sites because they are as important. Okay, great. Um, there's a, another question that's come through about reusable cups, asking how vendors are going to handle a reusable cup that could potentially be contaminated. Um, obviously, quite a wide issue um, with the uh, current pandemic. There has been some research into this. So I think about a hundred scientists uh, from, from uh, different research places um, have been looking into this. Um, and the reusables, as long as they're washed properly, they've um, they are stated should be safe to use. Um, I know there's also um, a different scheme that brands and different retailers have signed up to to do with using reusable cups in the process for this, which. Um, from what I understand, involves um, having the drink. So a consumer would put their reusable cup down, and then the barista would make the drink in a different cup, pour it into the reusable, and then the consumer would take that back. Um, slightly, um, I think that's how that process would work. Um, again, um, the question also asks about having uh, people having more than one reusable cup. Um, I've definitely overheard conversations, um, similar conversations on the train or with other commuters, um, where people mention that they've got more than more than one reusable cup. Um, but um, yes, that, that really varies. Yeah, just just from our experience, Samantha. I mean, uh, kind of anecdotally, what we're hearing from sites. Yeah. I mean, I again, this is this is from what I've heard, and this might be a, a very small snippet from the marketplace. Mm. I think. I think what we might see is a, is very much a short term spike in in a move to disposables um, as people come back to work. Uh, I think there's evidently a lot of fear out there, and I think employers, you know, from what we've heard, might be trying to do everything to break down the barriers of fear and make it as simple as possible. Um, mm -hmm. and whether that again, we won't know that until until the whole scenario plays out. Yeah. I think what what we may find is that actually the workplace doesn't have as many employees as previously before. So, you know, what I think we might see certainly from our side of things is actually a shift in the numbers and the large offices still being slightly smaller offices, which might have mm. which might have less people in, generate less cuts, which therefore makes the prior question about the smaller offices and the the, the, the more remote collections even more important from that side of things. Um, I think maybe as science science prevails, people may shift back to, to reusables in time. Um, but, it, you know, I don't think anyone can, can really predict the future at this moment in time. And we'll probably find out over the next six to 12 months. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just coming back to, I mean, the, the smaller sites, um, yeah, it, it can be a lot more difficult. I mean, thinking about those sort of storing cups, if they are potentially a small coffee shop or, or location. I know, um, there are also options, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, for, for post bags, so sort of having a, it might be sort of a cardboard box or a bag that, that you can post back um, to the collector for, filled with cups. Um, okay, so that brings us to 10.30. Um, the, so thank you for joining and I, you'll be able to access a, um, a copy of, of the recording uh, as well. Okay. Thank you for your time as well, Peter. No worries. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. Great.